Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 1. I'm not sure why God led me to this book right now, um, but after weeks of prayer, I felt the Holy Spirit leading me to the book of Philippians, and that's where we're going to be for the weeks ahead while I'm preaching. And I've titled this series, um, Gospel Focused in a Chaotic World, Gospel Focused in a Chaotic World, a study of the book of Philippians. So let's begin in verse 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 7 this morning, verses 1 through 7. It says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Let's pray. Lord, I humbly ask your blessing over this time ahead. Lord, you promised in your word that your word does not return void, that it accomplishes the thing that it's sent to do. And Lord, I pray this morning in the hearts of the people in this room that your word would accomplish what it is sent to do. Please give me clarity of thought and clarity with my mouth as I proclaim your word. I ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Have you ever had somebody in your life that showed a special amount of love to you? A unique person, a unique relationship in your life. I've had a few of those in life. Growing up in church, there was one lady in my home church named Dorothy. And Dorothy uh, loved me immensely. I don't know how because she changed my diapers, which you would think would make you not love someone. But Dorothy cared for me in the nursery and she always treated me special. And I remember often at church potluck, she made these dinner rolls that were very, very good. And I always complimented her how good they were. So she began to, when we had a church potluck, she would bring about a dozen dinner rolls for the church. And she'd bring about two dozen for me to take home and enjoy. So for, I, I, I really looked forward to almost every potluck for the next day or two days. I was eating these delicious rolls and I loved them. And that was just one of many things that Dorothy did that showed me love. As I grew older, she always encouraged me and prayed for me and asked how I was doing. And after I moved away, whenever I went back to visit church, to visit my home church, I always made sure I get by and give Dorothy a hug and see her. She was always so sweet to me, and, and I have so many fond memories of that. When, you, when we get into this book of Philippians here, what we're actually witnessing is a very special relationship between the Apostle Paul and a church. A church that showed an unusual, above-expected amount of love to Paul and really invested in Paul. And so we're actually getting in this letter, in this epistle, a special insight on a very unique and special relationship that Paul has with the church in Philippi. I don't want to take too long this morning, but I think it's important before we get into the, the book that we just review how did this church come to be. And I'm not going to go into too many details, but for those of you that read your Bible and read the book of Acts, let me just remind you of some things. So Paul is in Turkey, right? And he, he's on a missionary journey with Silas and, and with Luke, and they're going around, and all of a sudden he has a vision, and it's called the Macedonian Call. Paul has this vision that he needs to go to Macedonia, which is in modern-day Greece, which is entering out of Asia Minor and into southern Europe. And so Paul has this vision that he needs to go there. So, of course, they go there. One of the main cities in that area was this city in Philippi. And Paul and 
Silas get there, and when they ministered, there's actually no temple in Philippi. There was not enough Jews to have a temple. So they just began witnessing to people, and they led a woman named Lydia to the Lord. Do you remember that in your Bible reading? Lydia, she was a businesswoman who feared God, and they shared the gospel with her, and she got saved. And so the church began to grow, grow. and during that time, this young woman who was possessed with a demon was following Paul around, driving him insane. And so after days of this insanity, Paul cast the demon out of her with an amazing miracle, really. But what the problem was is that that young woman was also bringing a lot of profit to the city. And so the the men of the city, the businessmen, were very upset because Paul had meddled in their money, right? And that's one way to get people upset, isn't it, to meddle in their money. So Paul had cast this demon on this young lady, and so the men met together, and they, they beat Paul and Silas, and they cast them into prison. And as they're sitting in prison, does anyone remember what they were doing? They were singing. And as they're singing late in the night, and the jailer hears them, God, uh, in a miracle, has an earthquake. And the door opens, and the shackles come off, and the Philippian jailer runs in, and anyone remember what he says? What must I do to be saved? And he and his family accept Christ as Savior, and there's a wonderful work there. But, of course, Paul has to move on. So that is the backdrop we have into this book. These are the people that the Apostle Paul is writing to. And then we hear also in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about how this wasn't just any church, but they had actually sent support to Paul. Financial support, many times they had sent people and sent money to help him. In this book, in chapter 4, Paul says that the church helped him twice when he was in Thessalonica, which was a nearby city. So when Paul's traveling around, the church not only loved Paul, but they're helping him and they're encouraging him. They're sending him money. And in this letter, the purpose of this letter is because the church at Philippi had sent Epaphroditus, this man, 800 miles to check on Paul, to see how he was doing, to bring him resources, to help him. That's the equivalent of us sending someone by foot from the Michigan border to close to the Florida border on foot. Now, I don't know. He didn't have the Smoky Mountains to walk through, so that helped a little bit. But this was a major endeavor. So here is my point. This church had loved and had a very special relationship with the Apostle Paul. And today we're just beginning the insight on this special relationship and this message of what is the Apostle going to say to this special church. So please uh, look in verse 1 with me. It says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints. You may think, huh, that's just a normal greeting. No. Actually, many times Paul says to the church. For some reason in this situation, he says, to all the saints. My opinion is he's trying to personalize this. He loves these people individually, and he's getting very personal. It says, in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making request with joy. What Paul's saying in verse 3 and 4 is, every time I remember you guys, it makes me smile. I am joyful thinking about you. You, just the thought of you and how you got saved and you serving God and the church there at Philippi brings me great joy. The love and the support that the church of Philippi showed Paul made him happy and joyful every time he thought about them. The church encouraged Paul in his ministry. And in the verses ahead, Paul's going to tell us how they encouraged him and how they brought him joy. So this morning, I want us to see in this passage, if you're taking notes, this morning I want us to say three ways we should encourage each other in Christian ministry. Three ways we should encourage each other in Christian ministry. Look at verse 5 with me. It says, Paul is now going to explain why they are such a joy to him. In verse 5 he says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. The first point this morning is we should work together for the gospel. 
It says, verse 5 says, for your fellowship in the gospel. You know, the word fellowship brings a lot of different things to our mind, doesn't it? You've probably heard this joke, but there was a teacher uh, in this story who told her children to bring a symbol of their religion to show and tell. And so the day came and the Jewish boy went first and he said, this is our, our menorah, which we light uh, to celebrate Hanukkah. And the teacher said, oh, that's very nice. And then the next was a young Muslim boy. And he said, this is the prayer mat that I kneel down on and to pray towards Mecca. And the teacher said, that's nice. And then next was a Baptist boy. And he pulled out a casserole and said, this is how we celebrate everything at my church. I know that in our circles, we often associate the word fellowship with food, don't we? Now, I, I know just saying the word fellowship, some of you may salivate thinking about potato salad and cheesy, you know, cheesy potatoes or whatever. And, and, and that's a great thing. We love having that kind of fellowship here. But in this passage, in verse 5, this word fellowship is not how we use the word fellowship. The idea here is a participant or a partner. What Paul is saying is they, the church in Philippi was a partner in the gospel from the very first day until that current time. And that right there was an encouragement to Paul that they had partnered with him in the gospel. You know, real unity and encouragement comes when we unify around a common goal. That's really what brings unity is a common goal. And here at Calvary Baptist Church, our common goal should be the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Jesus came to earth, paid for our sins on the cross, and that by placing our faith in him, we can be reconciled to God and secure our eternal destiny. It is not, it is not complex, but it is wonderful and simple and clear. That is the gospel message. And folks, that is what we should be unified around, is the gospel message. And the fact that the church in Philippi was a partner to Paul in that, that brought him encouragement, that brought him joy. I remember as a teenager, our youth pastor would take us on winter campouts. Has anybody here ever camped in the middle of winter? A couple, okay. So what we would do is we'd get the 15-passenger church van, We'd load five or six teenage boys in it and a, do and a dog, and we would drive way up in the middle of nowhere in northern Michigan. And my youth pastor would drive around these back roads, which in case you're wondering, a 15-passenger church van is not a good off-road vehicle, okay? But we would do drive down these back roads, and he would just pick a spot. We would stop, and we would walk about 100 yards in the woods, carry all the gear, set up a tent, and camp in the snow. And we, you know, teenage boys, we loved it. It was awesome. And then we'd get up the next morning, break down the camp, and we'd go rabbit hunting the rest of the day and shoot some rabbits, and then we'd make our trip back. That was our, our uh, teen event, and I guess in a redneck church, that's the kind of things you do, you know? But I remember one specific winter camp out, the church van got stuck. We, were, we had just crested over this hill, and Pastor Mark had seen that there was quite a valley there. And it was icy and it was snowy. So he decided, you know what, this looks like a good spot to camp. I'm not going down that road. But he had gotten over the peak of the hill just on the edge of where it went down. And so we camped all night, but the next morning when we went to get out of there, the van was just spinning tires. And we have no cell phone reception. It's 10 degrees. It's snowy and icy. So all us five or six teenage boys, we got behind that van and we pushed as hard as we could and we're sweating, we started shedding layers, and I just remember it was a big ordeal, but we survived, we made it out, thankfully. But it took a while to get that van out, okay? Why am I sharing this crazy story? Because that whole weekend, as teenagers, with my youth pastor, we had fellowship, but when we pushed the van, we had partnership. That is what partnership, that is what working together really means. That's what is embodied in the word fellowship in verse 5, is working together towards a common goal. And honestly, folks, when we serve together, when we push together, there's no stronger bond than that. We can grow closer. It's great to stand around and talk, and how's your day, and talk about football, or talk about whatever, even talk about spiritual things. But when we serve together, that is something that is going to encourage us. And that's what encouraged Paul. So my question for you this morning is, are you, part, are you a partner? Are you part of the gospel ministry here at Calvary? 
Are you part of the gospel ministry here? Are you actively inviting people, witnessing to the lost, praying for lost people, engaging visitors, and encouraging people in the gospel? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can say that we sometimes fall into the trap here at church of being a spectator instead of being an active partner in the gospel. The most encouraging thing we can have around here is when we are working together as partners for the gospel. The second point this morning we see in verse 6, and this is we should evidence God's working in us. Let's read verse 6, very popular verse. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What is Paul saying here? What he's saying is that the church at Philippi, their consistent faithfulness, gave Paul confidence in the authenticity of their salvation. He knew that they were authentic believers, and the fruit of their life was the evidence that Jesus Christ indwelled them and was working in them through the Holy Spirit. This gave Paul excitement about the future. Look, at he says, until the day of Jesus Christ. He's looking forward to saying, from this point, until the Lord returns or until you pass away, God is going to continue to work in you. This excited Paul about the church. It encouraged Paul about the church at Philippi. We want to be encouraged about you when we see your life to say, God is working in you. I have to be honest with you. The reality is that oftentimes in church ministry, when we look at a person, we're not filled with encouragement. Oftentimes, as spiritual leaders, we're filled with fear and concern. Are they going to stick around? Are they going to be faithful to God? Are they truly saved? Are they truly truly growing? The church at Philippi had clearly demonstrated that God was working in them. And they understood, and, and Paul understood, that this was the real deal. That this was not just a quick, short thing that was going to happen and go away, but they were truly believers, and God was going to truly continue to work in their lives. When God truly saves somebody, you are saved, and he will sanctify you. There is no question about that. You can encourage your pastor. You can encourage the believers around you by evidencing the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That evidence is just consistency. It's just consistency. We see in Matthew 13, I won't have you turn there, but many of you know the parable of the sower. And the sower goes out to sow the seeds which represent the word of God. And without going into too much detail about that parable, in that parable, some of the seeds grow up in rocky soil, right? And they grow up and they look great. And then the sun comes and they wither. Other seeds fall in thorny ground and they also grow up, but the thorns grab them and they neither plant produces fruit. In the Christian life, in, this, in the church atmosphere there are times where people come they get excited they act like they're serious about the things of god they act like they're committed and within a year or two life gets hard things happen and they're nowhere to be found i'm not talking about moving churches god moves people from church to church that's not what i'm talking about what i'm talking about here is the idea that we can encourage each other by sticking it out and being faithful and producing fruit How do we do that? How do we ensure that we are truly saved? Not only that we are truly saved, but that how do we demonstrate our salvation to other people? We do that by maintaining a close walk with God and serving God with all of our lives. Look at the third point this morning with me is found in verse 7. The third point is we should continue through the seasons of ministry. Look at verse 7 with me. Even it is meat for me, to think of you all this way. We don't talk like that, that word meat, but what Paul is pretty much saying is it is right for me to think of you this way. It's right for me to have confidence in you because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. The third way we can encourage, we see in this passage that we can encourage each other is to continue through seasons of ministry. 
Paul had a deep love and appreciation for this church because whether he was in prison, whether he was preaching, wherever he was at, this church was faithfully loving and supporting him, faithfully partnering with him to advance the gospel. The phrase here, defense and confirmation, the word defense there is where we get the term apologetics. The word is apologia, which it pretty much has the idea of defending the gospel. And there are times in this church and in our lives where we need to stand up and say, that is wrong, that is untrue, that violates the truth of the gospel. There are other seasons where we are spending time teaching and explaining. That idea here in the past, verse 7, about confirming, kind of carries the idea of teaching both believers and unbelievers what is the true gospel. And then, of course, Paul talks about his time in bonds. Paul's writing this letter while he's in prison. And I can't help but imagine that he probably had many churches that supported him and helped him. But once he was off in prison, maybe that support stopped. Perhaps they were all about it when he was doing the work. But when he was sitting in a, in a cell or sitting in bondage, they no longer thought about him, no longer supported him. That was not the way of the church at Philippi. They consistently loved and supported Paul. The reality is that when we serve God, even here at church, in this context at Calvary Baptist Church, we're going to have times of success and prosperity and peace. And we're going to have times of rejection and persecution and frustration and depression. We need faithful partners, faithful part participants that are going to continue to be faithful through the seasons of ministry. That is what encourages us. We can look back. I've talked with Pastor Snyder, and he's shared many ministry stories with me about his past churches. And he's shared many times about some of the very difficult trials he's been through. And what he remembers when he looks back at those times is the people who were faithful to God and stood by and supported him. And that's what Paul is saying here. That's why he's writing this letter. That's why he has so much confidence in these people, because they supported him through all the seasons of ministry. There's a sense in which often we are fair weather people, aren't we? Like sports fans. You know, when a team is doing really well, everybody loves them. But, you know, that's why there's no Lions fans anymore, because they haven't done well for so many years. You know, they're a fair, you've, you've heard that term, fair weather fan. And then you've got the diehards that are buying season tickets just to watch them lose, you know, all the games. But what, you get a real fan. A real, and it's that way in, in life with friendships. It's that way in church ministry. Somebody who's truly committed for the right reasons will weather the storms. I found this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He said, your best way to prove your friend is to know that he will be your friend when you have not so much as a mean cottage. And when houseless and without clothing, you are driven to beg your bread. Thus, you would make true proof of a friend. Give me a friend who was born in the wintertime, whose cradle was rocked in the storm. He will last. Our fair weather friends shall flee away from us. Those are tight friends that will come the nearest to us when we are in the most distressed. But those are not friends who speed themselves away when ill times come. In this letter, Paul was at a difficult point in his ministry, and he's praising the church at Philippi, because even in the difficulty, they sent a man 800 miles to come encourage him, support him, and love him. That's the kind of thing we need to do as believers in this church, is we need to weather the different seasons of ministry, the good and the bad, for the cause of Christ. So I just want to ask you by conclusion today, I just want to ask you, are you a partner in the ministry here at Calvary? Or are you a consumer? So much of our culture, we are consumers. You go to the store and you have so much selection. We have been conditioned to pick and choose what we want in every aspect of life. Subway is popular for a reason, because you walk in and you can make the sub exactly how you want it. In our consumer mentality of life, we have been lulled into that. And sometimes we bring that attitude into the church. And that is not the attitude here that we're learning about here. This attitude is not a consumer, but a partner, a participant in the gospel. 
So I ask you again, are you a partner in the ministry here at Calvary? Are you a participant in gospel ministry or are you just a spectator? That is the question this passage asks us today. And only you know the answer to that. So may God help us all to be a faithful partner so we can encourage each other. We need encouragement, don't we? There's plenty to be discouraged about. We need encouragement in in this ministry here at Calvary Baptist Church. These are the ways we're going to encourage each other is by partnering for the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this um, book, Lord, the book of Philippians. Lord, I pray that you would just bless this series as we go through it. Lord, help me as I preach through it, that I would faithfully reflect what it's saying. Lord, thank you for the church at Philippi that modeled true love to Paul, that modeled how to encourage a man of God. Lord, help us in this area, Lord. We need encouragement. Help us to encourage one another by being faithful, by evidencing your work in our life. Lord, help us to do these things, to be engaged in gospel ministry. Lord, there's so many distractions. There's so many other things good things we could be doing. But Lord, we know that gospel ministry is the greatest of all these things. So help it to be said of us, Lord, here at Calvary, that we are partners with each other. We are working towards the gospel mission. Help us, Lord. In the moments ahead, as we meditate on these things, work in our hearts, Lord. If there's areas of fault where we have fallen short, please reveal them. And help us to make changes. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. We're going to have a few minutes to pray and think through these things and ask yourself, are you a partner in gospel ministry here at Calvary? Let's take some time to pray.